This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I am a writer and film critic and this is our 100th episode of the podcast. Cue sort of sound effects and Radio 1 style applause. Before we get started I'd like to say some thank yous to a bunch of people. First of all my family, Lydia, Alice and Rosaline, all of whom have had to put up with various inconveniences and absences in order to make this podcast possible. Lots of late dinners for instance. They've been supportive encouraging and most importantly they've taken the piss pretty constantly never once allowing me to get above myself which i think is an admirable trait in a family what they are basically there for i'd also like to thank elliot atkins who has written the music especially for the podcast and i think with its carpenter-esque slash morricone feel and yet it's all its own thing as well of course elliot is one of my oldest friends and he is a fellow film lover Many of the films we watched together and argued about and joked about while we lived in Liverpool, and that continues to this day. I'd also like to thank my guests, of which there have been too many, a hundred or so, to thank individually without leaving someone out, but they have all given their time and their expertise to provide me with a private film school that has taken me to places I've never been, or even favourite haunts but with new eyes. And finally, I have to thank my listeners, many of whom have basically provided the only promotion this podcast has had. I've met some of you in person uh, at various festivals and venues, others I've talked to or messaged with outside of Twitter. You've all always been uh, amazing, a source of constant encouragement. I'd like to name in particular Andy and Joe English, uh, Kai Ross, Jem Duduku, Christopher James, David Hughes, the cinematologists who have been very important in helping me out, Pamela Hutchinson and many others. Please forgive me if I've omitted your name here, but it is only proof of how much support I've received over the last two years that listing everybody would, uh, would, would just go on for, for over an hour, I'm sure. As regular listeners will already know, this was a lockdown-inspired project. It was only supposed to last for 10 episodes. But as long as the guests kept saying yes, and most importantly, great film books kept appearing, I felt there was no way I could stop, or indeed wanted to stop. In fact, I'm starting a new podcast, a second one, which will be available in the coming weeks. It's called Cinema Italia, or Cinema Italia, if I give it the proper Italian pronunciation, and will feature guests both from Italy and around the world talking about their favourite Italian movies, from the silence to the neo-realists to the spaghetti westerns and giallos, right up to the present day. Guests will include writers, filmmakers, actors, and will provide a panorama of the Italian cinematic scene. So hopefully you might consider subscribing to that podcast as well. Two podcasts in one week? No way. Oh, go on. But before you do any of that, I had the chance to talk to Matt Zola Seitz, a critic I've read and admired for years, uh, a critic who has written many books on The Sopranos, Wes Anderson, and most recently Deadwood. He has also become uh, an online source uh, for buying books, books specifically which cover the arts, and of course a large slice of those are books to do with cinema. Uh, many of our books, met, sorry, many of our guests who have featured on the podcast have been promoted and, and sold on uh, Matt Matt's site. So um, I'll put the links in the show notes for, so you can visit his site and uh, and continue um, and and support that as a, as a very worthy venture. If you enjoy the podcast, please remember to like and subscribe. Um, or, or not. It's the 100th episode. Why am I insisting on you doing things like this? You, you, you've you liked and subscribed enough, I'm sure. So if you enjoy the episode, just keep on coming and uh, and enjoy the conversation. Well, I 
think the first movie that kind of burrowed itself deep into into me was uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And I was nine years old. I was living with my brother and I were living with our grandparents. Our parents had gotten a divorce. They lived in Dallas and my grandparents lived in Kansas City. I didn't see too much of either of them. It's kind of a long story that I'll probably write a sad memoir about someday. But Essentially, my dad came to visit me in November of 1977, which I believe was around the time that Close Encounters came out. And um, I had already I already knew the entire plot of Close Encounters because I bought the bubblegum cards and the bubblegum cards like they had like every single thing that happened in it. So I knew everything that happened in it. But we went to see it and um, I was obsessed with the mothership. And I'm sure I'm sure looking back on it, it took me until I was, you know, middle aged to figure out, you know, the kind of associations with that like i saw more of my dad than i did of my mom and um and i think you know this idea of this sort of man child kind of heading to this place to be reunited with the mothership it's like you don't need to be a therapist to figure out what that's about and i was a little kid so of course i didn't think about movies in that way but i'm sure that was a part of it and it was really interesting because you know the fablemans came out and i and I understood my own obsession with Close Encounters in a, in a completely new way as a result of The Fablemans when I found out that, you know, there's a lot of stuff in in The Fablemans that is a re- kind of a reference to things that happen in Close Encounters, including all the stuff with the train set. That movie is kind of an imaginative, I, I call it an act of imaginative empathy on the part of Spielberg, where he's trying to understand his mother <clears throat> uh needing to leave her family in order to be happy and she wasn't happy with the family as much as she loved the family she wasn't happy with them close encounters he kind of sort of puts the mother and the father together in the character of roy neary it's sort of like spielberg and imagine it's sort of like i feel like it's him glomming together his own need to leave the family in arizona to go off to hollywood and 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 seek this miraculous event which turns out to be his own career and and his mother, who, of course, you know, did leave the family just as the Fableman's details. And um, yeah, so, you know, yeah, it would be it would be Close Encounters. There were other movies that I was really into prior to that, like the remake of King Kong with Jessica Lange, which I bought a scholastic book about the making of it. That was the first making of book that I can ever remember reading. But it was Close Encounters. The, that was the one that really, like, got me right in the heart. And, and in the mind. And uh, that came out the same year as Star Wars. And I remember, of course, I was into Star Wars. I think you were legally not allowed to to be disinterested in Star Wars at that time. But it, but I remember even as a kid thinking that Star Wars, Star Wars didn't fuck me up in the way that Close Encounters did. Close Encounters was the first was the first big Hollywood blockbuster. And it was a huge hit. It was one of the top films of the year. And it was on the cover of, I think, Newsweek. That was the first blockbuster that I remember feeling profoundly moved by and i don't just mean in the sense of it gave me the feels as the kids say but but also like i felt like some like my internal organs were being rearranged by having watched this movie and i went back to see it several more times but so that's my answer i'm sorry it was so long (laughs) keep them as long as you like as epic as epic as the film itself (laughs) no i mean i remember my uh my encounter with close encounters I don't think it was on the uh, the cinema screen. I think because I was a, maybe just a little bit too young for Close Encounters. Although I did see Star Wars that year as the very first film I ever saw at the cinema. Wow! How old were you? Uh, I will have been about five or six, I think. So so pretty young. I'll I'll, I'll have been dragged along with my brother as a sort of like um, you can't leave him at home if you're going to take Francis, you have to take John. That'll have been the the conversation, I'm sure. But I have very strong memories of it. I, at least I have very strong memories of of queuing up, of going in, and the film had already started. So mm-hmm. I saw the bit, and I thought it was Steve McQueen. There's a guy with very blue eyes who's one of the rebels who gets killed by Darth Vader but very quickly. And I, <laughs> I, I, and I thought, oh, Steve McQueen's in this. I was young. You thought, you thought, you thought oh, they killed Steve McQueen. Yeah. On your- <laughs> in the very first uh, in the very first scene. So I remember that, and I, rem- and, and I, and I, I kind of, after that, I, it's it's a mush of of feeling, and I remember getting fish and chips on the way home. That was the that was the whole because it came to England in seventy eight. It was January seventy eight. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That it, that's 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 that sounds right. Yeah, you know, it's really is this your this is your hundredth episode? Is that right? Yeah, it's that's very that's quite a milestone. 
That's quite a milestone. And I wanted to, before we go any further, I wanted to congratulate you on that and, and say what an honor it is to be a guest on your 100th podcast, considering the, the, the luminaries that you have had on here uh, in the past. It's, re- it's really a very impressive uh, uh, enterprise that you've got here. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate that. It's a really, uh, it's been, it's been a hell of a lot of fun. It's been a real privilege to talk to, to, to as you say, those luminaries, people I never dreamed I'd get an opportunity to talk to. And it's, it's been, uh, it's been a heck of a heck of an adventure and long may it continue. Well, absolutely. And yeah, and you've had a lot of, a lot of people whose work I admire a great deal on here and who are just interesting people. And, you know, they, Dana Stevens and Charles Romesco, both of whom I've I've hosted events uh, with Dan Mervish, the filmmaker Dan Mervish, who I think is really interesting. Like he's really like I have a soft spot for any filmmaker whose movies go, who the hell is the audience for this? All of his films fit that description. And I mean that with with love and respect, like he doesn't seem like he has one eye on the box office at all. <laughs> you know, and and yet and yet there's there's a lot of substance and a lot of feeling there and like he's kind of doing it old school yeah I, I love the fact that he's so he's so into all aspects of the filmmaking process from you know from the very obviously the inception and the making itself but also the promotion of it and you know how excited he is when people get to see it how many times have you had george stevens jr on twice three times twice he, so what what's the what is the what is the fascination with George Stevens Jr. Well, initially it was um, he did this memoir, but I I've been kind of uh, from last year from like February um, I've been writing a book from last February. Sorry, I've been writing a biography of Terence Malick. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've had this idea of sort of crossing the beams to to use a Ghostbusters analogy badly of mm-hmm. um of sort of trying to get people onto the podcast who would also be willing to talk about Terry and give me some insight into into someone who is otherwise a fairly mysterious figure as I'm sure you'll know. And so he has been very useful to me sort of uh in in that regard and he has been very um and and he's and his book when I read it is just so fascinating he's such a i mean this guy has met every president he's talked to every huge heroes in film um yeah i mean i think he lived on the same ha- uh, same street as like bing crosby and stan laurel and people like that just like legends who who we don't even think about sort of going up and going who go to pick up the mail at the end of the street or pick up the newspaper right. off their lawns and they and that's that's he's he's growing up in that sort of environment so and of course as the founder of the AFI you know arguably one of one of the most influential people in american film yeah yeah absolutely yeah and a bridge kind of a bridge between eras of hollywood yeah exactly so you so he's there with the 70s he's there with people like david lynch is in the second year of the AFI conservatory and he's also there suggesting to his father that he should make Shane as a film you know that's yes. that's a pretty that's a pretty remarkable sort of stretch I don't mean uh, even further towards the present day in terms of, you know, uh, Barack Obama and, and, you know, I mean, he was producing the Thin Red Line as well. And you and you also you interviewed Michael Benson, who's the author of what it may, might be one of the best making of books I've ever read in my life. The two the book about 2001 Space Odyssey. And, and that's a, that's a book where, like, I'm such an evangelist for that book that I think people cross the street when they see me coming because they know I'm going to talk about Michael Benson's <laughs> 2001 book. And, and, you know, wow. what And so much stuff in there that you didn't know before. I didn't know before, certainly. Well, I thought I was a huge, well, I am a huge fan of 2001. I would consider that's another film, even though I, I watched it on a sort of black and white portable television, uh, was my first exposure to it. But that's a film I would consider one that absolutely changed my view of what cinema, what was possible with cinema. And I think I'd read the Arthur C. Clarke's Lost Worlds of 2001, which was um, probably published relatively contemporary to the film coming out itself. And so reading Michael Benson's book, I thought, oh, I'll know this. I'll, I know all of this, surely. And I, I didn't know, as you say, I didn't know 90% of it. And it really changed my, the way I viewed the film afterwards. Yeah, I, the biggest, the big, uh, the two of the biggest anecdotes for me in there were the, you know, the fact that he originally wanted to show the alien or whatever the things were at the end of it. And he kept putting it off and putting it off because he wanted it to be something that no one had ever seen before. 
and he couldn't get the special effects right. And also he ran into a conceptual problem, which is the human mind cannot conceive of something that does not exist. That, that has no connection to something that's already known. That's that's kind of a basic rule of, of creativity. And that's why no matter how unusual aliens are when you see them in the movies, they're always sort of reminiscent of things on Earth, like they're they're furry, they're scaly, they're they're amphibians, they're octo- octopi or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, in the end, he just decided not to show it. And, of, and and then the other one is the monolith. I love the I love the anecdote about the monolith that it's it was originally it was a, I think a trapezoid or a uh, or a pyramid a pyramid and they built it and they Frankenstein and Sons was the name of the prop company. I'll never forget that. What a name! And and Frankenstein and Sons builds this. You know, they say we can't build a lucite pyramid. It's going to be too heavy. It's going to be too difficult to transport. Will you consider making it some other shape? And they decided to go with this, this kind of domino shape, which looks like a door, which turns out to be perfect for the movie. And and he said, well, I wanted it to be transparent. And they said, well, we can't really do it out of glass. It's you. You'll never be able to keep it clean. And there's also the the risk of you know if it shatters, it could hurt someone. So why don't we try Lucite? And they make it out of Lucite and they put it weighs a ton, literally. And they put it on a flatbed truck and take it to Kubrick's studio and they prop it up and he looks at it through the viewfinder and he says, it looks like a, it looks like a big bar of soap. Take it away. And his, and his producer says, look, we went to all this time and expense and trouble to get this thing in here. Why is there something else we can do to it? Can we maybe paint it a different color? And Kubrick's like, I don't know, screw it, paint it black, whatever. And that, and then he then they bring it back onto the set and he looks at it and he's like, oh my God, that's it. And and it, it, it's just such a lesson, like, you know, because I think there's this misperception that filmmakers like him, had they so, quote unquote, have everything planned down in advance. And no, they don't. There's a, there's as much serendipity in a Control Freaks movie as there is in somebody who wings it. One of my favorite stories from that book, I think, is in the reception of the film as well, where, where they have that disastrous New York premiere. And yeah. you could hear the banging of the seats as people are getting up to leave. Why? Well, I think I think it was Washington D.C. actually, but and then he cut twenty he cut twenty minutes out of it or something like that. He he had like two running scenes, you know, the running around the spaceship scene, which is so striking and so amazing. He had like another one, which was about the same length. And people were like, after, after the first one, they were like, okay, we, we, we've seen this already. We don't need to see it again. Well, I also love that this is, you know, this is an example of a, a thing that I talk about a lot, which is that great movies find their audience eventually. Eventually, mm. they find their audience. And in the case of 2001, it found its audience a lot faster than anyone would have thought. It got... It got mixed reviews. Everybody was impressed with the look of it and the visual effects, but a lot of people thought it was too too obscure, too too pretentious, too too boring, too slow, uh, too this, too that. Uh, I don't think that they thought that the that what was going to make the film a hit would be hippies taking drugs and going to see it, but that's exactly what happened. In fact, my own dad told me about that. He I think he took psilocybin and went to see two thousand one with my mother. <laughs> and, uh, and, and david Ch- and david chase david chase the creator of the sopranos has talked to me about that in 2000 he took drugs and went to see 2001 multiple times with the woman who's now his wife um and there was a lot of you know mind expansion going on and after the film had been out for a while they put out a new poster that and it said the ultimate trip on the poster right when that was why because they they were finding out that the real hardcore the audience that was making this film one of the biggest hits uh, of of the year was uh, it was not people in their 40s and 50s. It was people in their 20s. Just that idea as well that it was this countercultural um, success when, when Kubrick himself doesn't strike me particularly as a cal- countercultural figure, uh, you know, accepting embodying sort of um, artistic freedom, I guess. No, and yet he can, and yet he sort of did. He he mm. he did in his own way, and I think he did it incidentally, just by by you know as a byproduct of trying to trying to make movies his way, and and you know to the point of even move you know moving to England in order to have more uh, privacy and and have kind of a bubble around himself, which you know carries its own drawbacks, I would suppose, but. Yeah, I I love those kinds of stories, and I love this. I I love the process. I love I love talking about the process and the way that the process informs uh, what we see on screen. And and I think it's interesting. And I think the form of a film is is as important as the content. And and as I'm sure you know, I I get cranky when I see criticism that doesn't talk about content, doesn't talk about filmmaking at all. Where mm. it's like you know these are not just de- delivery devices for for 
messages which you can then pronounce as acceptable or socially unacceptable and write an op-ed about it. And a lot, and a lot of film criticism now is basically it's editorials. It's editorials mm. and they use the movie as a jumping off point for their editorial. I'm a pretty left wing guy, actually. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm certainly trying to be sensitive to all of that when I write. But there's more going on in art than the messages. And if it was only about the messages, you wouldn't need movies. You could just have you. you the filmmaker could just send a PDF of the script to everyone. You know? Like that's that's what it's about. And there's also the other related thing, which is that movies are a sensory experience and they're they're about the effect of those images and the and the and the sounds and the music and on and the colors uh, on you. And it's and it's similar to it's not just like it is like reading a book and it is like going to a play, but it's also like going to an art gallery or going to a concert and and uh, or a multimedia show or something or a fireworks display. There are some movies that are basically fireworks displays. I, I would I would argue that probably half of the running time of any James Bond or Star Wars film is a fireworks display, a series of controlled explosions. That's right. And, and some fi- and some fireworks displays are, are better done than others. You know, I've I've been to some that were quite disappointing, and others that I couldn't even believe how awesome it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think that's true. I used to have an old professor, uh, Brian Nellis, who uh, once uh, berated me for for uh, some piece of sort of undergraduate sort of left wing judgmentalism, I guess, or or, and he said, "No, Bleasdale." Life is wider than argument, and I just thought, Ooh. I just thought that is so true. There is so much that because uh, argument, you have to narrow it down to make your point. You know, point is a very reduced thing. Yes, and and, and you know, life doesn't life isn't made of points. Life is made of waves. No, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And also, what are you you know. Uh, this substrain of criticism where it's about the, you know, is the behavior of this character acceptable or unacceptable? Who cares? Who cares? Mm. It, you know, the, the, what's important is, does the movie endorse it? If the mm. movie endorses it, if they show somebody be, behaving in a completely abominable way and the movie seems to be reveling in it, well, yeah, then I think you have a problem. But if it's merely presented and you're supposed to have your own reaction to it, and, and you know, I keep coming back to Scorsese, who I think virtually alone among big-budget, serious adult filmmakers doesn't tell audiences how they're supposed to feel about things. And, and he gets it. I, I think one of the reasons Scorsese makes people so uncomfortable is he makes these movies about people who are, not all of them, you know, the religious films often the main characters are 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 exemplary human beings but the crime films they're not and and one of the things that he shows you is that these guys at least to the people in their circle are exciting they're exciting mm. they enter the room and they bring an instability a volatility a chaos an element of 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 anything can happen that is very attractive to certain people, particularly people who don't really have a strong personality. And all that stuff is in the movies, too. And whether it's Goodfellas, Casino, Mean Streets, The Wolf of Wall Street, The Departed, you see, you know, that whole uh, kind of leader of the pack sort of thing that happens where all the guys fall in line beca- behind whoever's the loudest and the scariest. I, You know, it's just like movies about drugs, like train spotting. Yeah, I know you did an episode about train spotting. It's you know, one of the brilliant things about train spotting is it shows you how under under certain circumstances and particularly at the beginning of the experience, drugs are are, are exciting. I mm. mean, sometimes they're exciting in a horrible way because you don't know. It's like, am I going to am I going to do something that's going to get me in jail or or completely irreparably ruin my life? Like that's that's part of the appeal is getting away with something and 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 feeling that high and that rush. And then a few hours later or the next day, you're like, oh, my God, why did I do this to myself? Alcohol has the same effect. And like, you know, I, I, I love movies like that. And some of my favorite television dramas are like that, where you're supposed to grapple with your conflicted response to the characters and the material. That's the entire point of it. And if the movie is just sitting here saying bad, 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 these are bad people. They're so bad. Aren't you glad you're not bad? Like, well, where's the art in that? You know, are we children? <laughs> right, right. Does everything have to be a teachable moment for an eight-year-old child to understand without help? And I mean, it goes with the I have sort of the thought experiment of, a, of of could you allow for the fact that there is a film that you utterly agree with from a political point of view, but as a film is just completely tedious to you. 
I've seen a million of them. <laughs> exactly. And 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 the flip and the flip of that, which is, you know, can you think of a film which is abhorrent to you politically, but you you can't help but admire as a piece of cinema? It does something to you. Well, but, uh, probably, you know, a good percentage of all the great action films that have been made fall under that category for me because I hate the fact that so much of cinema is glorifying law enforcement and, and particularly glorifying uh, this idea that you can't really get justice for society unless you break the rules. And and there was this entire, it's still going on after the Miranda decision where, where uh, suspects uh, had certain constitutionally protected rights. There was this whole string of movies and it was, some of them were cop movies and some were vigilante movies, but the entire point was the quote unquote liberal establishment was protecting criminals, which was not what was happening. I mean, they were, they were ensuring certain minimum protections against the state, which had a, which had a legal monopoly on violence. And that was an entirely different thing. That's a little bit more hard to explain to a general audience, but movies like the entire dirty Harry franchise, the lethal weapon movies, the French connection, you know, uh, you know, a lot of Stallone's films, Schwarzenegger's films, even, you know, even Michael Douglas made a couple of them where the whole point is, you know, the, the scene where they, the cops get called into their commanding officer's uh, office and reprimanded for not, not observing the, the, the suspect's rights. And they're like, well, he was in the middle of, you know, killing a bus full of children or something. <laughs> like there's always some extreme example. And, um, and yet, and yet, you know, these are, these are great movies. The French connection is a great movie. The first dirty Harry is a great movie. Uh, the first leap of weapon and parts of the others are, are superb. And, you know, I could go on, but like, you know, these are reactionary films. They're reactionary. Even Die Hard is pretty reactionary politically, not just in terms of like cops, but also marriage. Uh, now, now I've seen you shoot a bunch of people. I see what's, uh, you, I, I'm going to take your name again. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And mean, but, but you have to admire the absolute perfection of the way it's constructed right down to the point where you know, the uh, Holly was given a watch by this, by the yuppie cokehead Hollis, uh, who obviously had designs on her, and and that watch symbolizes the the pull of Los Angeles of pulling away from the marriage, pulling pulling her towards her career and away from her family, and the last thing that happens when she's you know uh, Hans is hanging on to her arm is you know they click the little the the what do you call it on the wristband the clasp, and open, the clasp thank you and and the clasp the watch relieving holly of the watch which is the symbol of her alternate future is what uh, is what ultimately defeats evil and brings her back to john and you know you can look at that and go ooh reactionary messages bad 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 or you can look at it the way you would look at something in shakespeare or chaucer and go wow how beautifully put together that is and you can do both things that's really the amazing part of it you can actually have both reactions and i do <laughs> that, I mean, that's the the walking and chewing gum of adulthood, isn't it? The ability to to. to yeah. I mean, um, I I'm not sure if I've mentioned this on the podcast, but it's certainly something I, I suggested on Twitter is is we get away from saying but all the time and start saying and as a conjunction. Yes. So yes. this this can be true and this can be true, and and you don't have to even establish a but as a sort of mitigating sort of effect that one statement will have on the other or subordinate I, one statement to another. I've actually thought that, you know, if I, at some point I'm going to put together an anthology of reviews and I'm, th and I'm one of the possible titles I thought of was at the same time, at the same time. And the reason I would choose that is I was looking back, you know, over my archive of stuff, which is like 30, 30 plus years of writing. And I realized I use that phrase a lot. And I use that phrase as a way of reaching out to the reader and saying, you know, this, this movie is this. And at the same time, it's this. You know, and I and I like that construction because it, it indicates that the I like to think of it as like two two works of art that are transparent that are superimposed over each other to make another thing. It's that kind of you know that Godardian uh, sort of it's like the dialectical uh, notion of editing and storytelling where it's you know you allow these things to be in conflict, you allow them to be in tension, you allow them to coexist and and even merge uh, but they but they remain separate things they remain it's not like you're creating a third thing out of it they they get to have their own integrity and and spike lee is great at that spike lee is an absolute master at that and and to a point where i think it, it i think it's hurt him commercially you, mm. you know where, he, where his movies are uh you know extremely sensitive in some ways and extremely insensitive in others and and uh 
uh, very forward thinking in certain ways and very backwards in others. And all of these things coexist. Yeah, I mean, we can have it in other art forms. We can have the music and the and the lyrics of opera. We can have the dance and the movement and the staging in ballet, you know, and movies, if anything, just has so many more moving parts. It's going to be so much more complex in that sense. Yeah, definitely. And I, I also like it when um, when there's a scene in a movie where the character that you kind of identify with and root for, despite how sort of abominable they are in certain ways, that, uh, you know, sometimes there will be a scene where a character who who represents the naysayers in the audience will come in and say, uh, that's bad. <laughs> mm. Mm. what do you what you're doing is horrible and 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 you get to see the character kind of brush them off and then and then i like and those scenes when they're badly done they can sort of seem like like the like the academic uh sort of uh predictable sunday supplement sort of critic is coming in and chastising the hero uh, but when it's well done it's it kind of throws it back into the audience's lap and says, you've been, you, we have acknowledged what a piece of crap this person is. And, and are you still rooting for them? And if the answer is yes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Walter Chow making that point about Eddie Murphy's response to Nick Nolte in uh, in After Hours, where he kind of, Nick Nolte tries to apologize for his racist language, and Eddie Murphy sort of says, you know, not good enough, really. You know, he's like, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm not just going to go, yep, yeah, that's fine, you know. Right. Um, and, well, and also, that's, that's another thing, you know, movies, there's so many cliches in movies, particularly Hollywood movies. Um, and one of them is the idea that um, somebody can be an absolutely horrible person for their whole life, and then they do one heroic thing and all is forgiven. And probably the most, it's still the most notorious comical example to me is Darth Vader in Return of the Jedi. It's like, he saves his own son. Well, okay, but who wouldn't do that? <laughs> that is not where the bar, that's where the bar is. It's like, you don't think Hitler would have done that? And we're basically talking about space Hitler here. <laughs> You know, <laughs> absolutely. Like, oh, oh, that's okay. I guess he was. I guess he was still. There was still some decency left in him. It's like, well, tell it to the people of Alderaan. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's such as it's a sign of how convincing that film is as well. That you don't it really, you, you don't really care. You, you you're willing to shed a tear. Yes, exactly. As exactly. John as John Williams plays uh, the Imperial March on a slow harpsichord. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, boy, that's that's a whole other thing. Uh, John John Williams. Uh, gosh, what can you say about John Williams? He just had a birthday recently. Uh, what is he like? Eighty now or eighty five? I think. He's oh 80, yeah, I think he's heading 80. towards Clint Eastwood age, isn't he? He's he's what a, what a machine, and I believe he's finally retired. I think I read that the Fablemans was his last. Uh, was his last score and uh but that's somebody who he has an identity as strong as any director and i'll, I'll never mm. forget my son was about 10 or 11 and uh i said uh well you want to watch a movie tonight and he said yeah and i said what do you want to watch and he said i want to watch a john williams movie and i got confused for a second and i said a john williams movie what do you mean and he said you know like like Star Wars or Harry Potter or Jaws or and I realized oh my god there are certain types of movies you know these fantasy and action and genre films that have John Williams scores and my son thought of those as John Williams movies and 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 they they kind of are I I'd like to see an Ennio Morricone movie any day of the week well, yeah, and in fact, th th those are two composers, I would say, who have such strong personalities and are in such command of their craft that the music often fools me into thinking the movie's better than it is. Like, mm. what was that movie uh, by uh, uh, Giuseppe Tornatore, the, uh, the the movie with um, Monica Bellucci? Malena? Was it Malena? Malena, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that I think that's kind of a terrible movie. I'm just going to say it. I mean, it's beautifully directed and... and, and uh, Everything about it is great, except the movie, I think, is really, really specious and kind of weak in a lot of ways. But that score, oh, my God, that score, mm. that score. And I came out of it thinking like, you know, thinking I'd seen something and I realized it was just the score that did that. It's really kind of a mess. And and uh, I think there's been a few others that that he scored that like I think The Untouchables is half the movie without that score. 
like if you'd had somebody like Dave, you know, if Dave Grusin had done the, didn't done the score of the untouchables and I like him fine on other films, but you know, you, we wouldn't be talking about it today. It's that, it's that oomph that he brought. <laughs> he's got so many, he's got so many, I mean, like, could you have about long drawn out sort of slow motion waiting at the, the central uh, railway station without, you know, any Morricone scoring it, you know, it, it just, no, feels no, so you nice. can't, you can't. You can't. And I just watched The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly was on one of the cable stations a couple of nights ago, and I watched uh, I watched most of it. And it was chopped up for commercials, and it was pan and scan, and, you know, it was kind of miserable knowing what it actually looks and sounds like. And yet, there's that phrase again, I watched the whole thing. And yes. that and the, the, that final sequence that begins with Tuco running around in the cemetery uh, looking for Art Stanton's gravestone, and Ennio Morricone's score hits this peak of hysteria hysteria and it's so be- that sequence is so beautiful and and there you talk about it and yet you know uh or an at the same time like that's a, to me that's a sequence where to me what's going on like as a viewer is i'm seeing you've just come out of that whole civil war sequence which is about the tremendous epic waste of human life that's going on all around these guys who were looking for gold and Tuco is doesn't care about any of that. He just wants to find the the gravestone where the gold is contained. Uh, but the the scene is also kind of this. It's this lament for the for the sheer scale of the suffering and the fact that you've got this guy who's really his only concern is money running around in there. Like he's not thinking, oh, the humanity. But I but I feel <laughs> like the movie the movie is. Yes, the yes. movie is in some strange way. <laughs> was it? I think Christopher Frayling said that um, Sergio Leone's movies are um, operas in which the arias are stared rather than sung. <laughs> that, that, yeah, I love that, that phrase. Final sequence is is totally that. I love that. I love that. So that I'm so glad that you that you uh, quoted that because that phrase has been in my head for several months and I couldn't remember where I, where I saw it. But that's but that's yeah, that's perfect. Absolutely perfect. And they are operas and operas. You know, bringing it back to operas. I mean, how many of the great operas are 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 based around uh, basic stories that would not stand up to the scrutiny of a of an editorial page columnist who is looking at more at mainly at the morals. Oh, oh, she's got TB. Is that it? Is that it? She's just good. The cop and die is that all she's going to do that's so passive you know <laughs> yes 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 and also just you know so many of the operas based on mythology are you know they're they're unabashed unabashedly royalist in their in their in their biases and and very much buying into you know the the right of kings and queens to do whatever they want and god ordaining certain things and you know people being punished for the transgression of not doing what the royal person wants and all of that. I mean, you know, pretty much almost all of Shakespeare is about that. And and but if you can't find your own way into it as a viewer, then it's your problem. It's really yeah. your problem. And and I love uh, I, I love, the you know, the tragedies of Shakespeare are so uh, so much the guide for a lot of the movies that I like. I mean, there's no reason why you should care about Macbeth at all. Yet he gets the most beautiful speech in, in Shakespeare. He gets the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech, which is which which oh. as well, just within that speech, even if you re- you don't know anything about the play, the speech itself is saying something which is utterly nihilistic. You know, it's basically yeah. the universe makes absolutely no sense so we so we can do whatever you like and it doesn't matter. But it says it so beautifully. <laughs> it's illumin it's so illuminating and it's also, you know, on a basic level the story of Macbeth is film. It's film noir. It's like the original film noir. It's a guy who's he's smart and ambitious, but he's not as smart. He's more ambitious than he is smart, and he's and he's got a woman in his life who's way smarter than he is, who sees him as her instrument. And and you know, it's really like how it, like she's she's the original femme fatale, and uh, and it's funny. And that's that's the other thing about Shakespeare is he's funny. He's funny, and mm. sometimes he's funny on. Uh, he's directly funny. Like characters say things that are amusingly phrased, or or they're they they catch your attention because they're true. There's something about it that's speaking the truth. But other times they're funny because of the situation. And 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 Macbeth is. I, I never thought I would say this, but Macbeth Macbeth is a stitch. It really is. <laughs> and like as it goes on, like the guy keeps digging himself deeper and deeper into a hole. And and like the it's like well how can and now we're in even worse trouble. It's like oh look at another fine mess you've gotten us gotten us into. And um, the solution is always, well, we got to kill some more people. 
What about that guy? You haven't killed him yet. Maybe if you kill him, it'll be better now. You know, it's just... <laughs> I'm so far into waded into blood that it would be as tedious to go back as it would to go forward. Just right. the... Just the fact that he uses tedious, not not it would be you know as difficult or, but it would be as boring to go backwards as it would to go forwards. So. Right, right. Well, the, yeah, there is a certain point where you're like, eh, why not? <laughs> why not? And 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 yeah, <laughs> but they're children, sire. Oh well, we haven't tried children yet. Maybe children will be the answer. <laughs> no, that's yeah, that's right. Let's let yeah, let's see what haven't what what taboo haven't we broken yet? I mean, speaking of Shakespeare. Um, uh, one of the other books that you wrote that I really, uh, I really loved reading was uh, I, over COVID. I did a rewatch of uh, the Sopranos with my uh, daughter. I, I used it as an opportunity to sort of read your book chapter by chapter as we went through the episodes. There's there's a a TV show that absolutely um, merits comparison with Shakespeare. I think I don't think that's hyperbole. <laughs> No, I don't think it. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. And the, and the, and the, that central that marriage uh, between Tony and Carmela is is one of the great one of the great marriages of convenience, I guess, in some ways uh, that you've ever seen. And it's so it's it's so deep. It's so deep and so believable. And uh, the way that they have made peace with each other's uh, heinousness. And and that and you know, I was speaking about scenes where a character kind of lays it on the line for you morally and then you have to decide where you're going to go as a viewer there's a, the, one of the great scenes in the history of television is the scene where uh carmela goes to a different shrink and he tells her uh essentially look here's the source of your unhappiness you're married to a criminal you're married to a murderous thieving criminal and all the mo- all the money that you that that allows you to live so comfortably is blood money and and you're you know unless you take your kids and leave this guy you're never going to you're never going to be happy and also you're going you're a horrible person basically he tells her you're a hor- you're a horrible person and the only way to solve this is by removing the circumstances that that make your behavior horrible and she doesn't want to hear it <laughs> she doesn't want to hear it and she stays with him and that's very that's very realistic and, that, and i think what that show got better than probably any drama that's ever been on tv is how probably 98 99 out of 100 people when faced with a situation like that would do the convenient thing and people are on that show are constantly doing the convenient thing instead of the right thing and that's why they tolerate ralphie for as long as they do and it gnaws at tony like tony has just enough of a sort of buried gnarled misshapen conscience to know that this guy is the devil um but the devil is allowed to live among them and they just sort of step around him and 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 look the other way and gandolfini does some amazing work in all the scenes with joe pantoliano where you can tell that tony hates this guy he hates the fact that he even draws breath and and you know the murder that he committed uh i mean they, all those guys kill people but the murder he committed was a, was an innocent person a truly an innocent person who reminded tony of his own daughter and and for money's sake and for for the job's sake he he looks the other way until finally he doesn't and and when he finally does get justice for tracy or revenge against ralphie it's it's strongly suggested that perhaps the thing that Tony thinks he's guilty of, he maybe didn't even do. I mean, I have that argument with people a lot. It's like, did Ralphie burn down the stable? What do you, do you think he burned down the stable? Yeah, I don't think it matters really. I think it's sort of, I think it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I'm, I don't remember having a, a, a really strong opinion either way on that. I, I just assumed that it, it, it was a, a straw, you know, it was, um, or even a straw man in the sense that it was a, a motivation that just gave him enough reason to do what he needed to do anyway. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, I think that. And and I also think that, you know, given what we know about the Sopranos, the idea of a guy who is guilty of so much being killed for something he didn't do seems very Sopranos to me. That's why, that's how I prefer to go. But I love that they don't, they don't come down on one side or the other. And and in fact, David Chase himself was confused when, <laughs> when Alan Steppenwall and I asked him about that plot line, it's like, did Ralphie burn down the stable? And, and at first he said, well, uh, no. And then he corrected himself and said, yes. And then he, I think he amended himself again. He was like, we told Ralphie that, that he didn't do it. Um, but, uh, doesn't matter as you say, <laughs> it doesn't matter for, for purposes of what happens. It doesn't matter. 
<laughs> which which is uh, that conversation you have with David Chase at the end of the book. Uh, you talk about um, the ending. I think there's a, there's a long back and forth with you guys about the ending because there's this real sense of, well, I mean, it, it just demands, it demands argument. We're demanding closure. We want something out of it that it's not giving us. But at the same time, that that is a, a central point that he's trying to make. Well, and to me, I, I, I love what I love about that final scene is that it, it flushes out the people who cannot cannot stomach ambiguity. It flushes them out like 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 pheasants from a bush and and they come forward uh, uh, demanding answers and demanding that the mystery be solved. And they can't they cannot seem to sleep at night unless they feel that they know what happened. And a large part of The Sopranos is about not being able to find out what happened. And that's and that's, you know, what happens when people get killed is that the people in the mob tell them, uh, tell everyone who's still alive, they're in witness protection. And it's a very interesting euphemism that they use. It's like, yeah, he's in witness protection now. He's actually at the bottom of a swamp or he's like chopped up somewhere. Um, But they say, yeah, he's in witness protection or she went into witness protection. And um, and everyone kind of knows what that meant, but they leave them a little bit of doubt. And sometimes characters on the show actually do go into witness protection. (laughs) Just to muddy the waters (laughs) even further. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of things in life that you're just never going to know. You just never know. And uh, I told my daughter years and years ago, I don't remember what the original discussion was about. I said, I. I said, I like ambiguity in my art and certainty in my life. And and she said, well, then you're truly fucked, Dad. Because it's going to be the other way around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's also that thing of sort of knowing and uh, knowing, but being able to not know that you know, if you know what yes. I mean. It's sort of like, now, it, it seems to be the recent events in uh, globally have been situations in which we've found out what we already know and now we can't yes. deny it anymore you know yes yes and there's also you know there's so many instances where we know full well what's actually going on but the people who are perpetrating it deny it or obscure it or otherwise mess with our perceptions i just recently was reading a story about a book banning a, a, a an effort to ban so-called offensive books from schools and a lot of them aren't even offensive at all they're just tell, they're just reminding people of unpleasant truths about American life. That's the real point of this, is they want to suppress knowledge of the horrible things that have been done in America for hundreds of years. And uh, the group that's spearheading the book banning is called Moms for Liberty. (laughs) Moms for Liberty. That's a a Sopranos-level name, wouldn't you say? Moms Moms for Liberty. What do you do? I'm the head of a group called Moms for Liberty. What do you do? We ban books. We get books removed from libraries. Terry Gilliam is writing the the present day. It's like Children (laughs) of Men has become a documentary. We're not we're no longer. (laughs) Yes. Yes, yes. Well, but how many times have you found that? You know, you 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 read a, a news story and it's about like some you know, some group is spearheading like an opposition to a public housing project or affordable housing. And, and it turns out it's a it's a multi-billion dollar real estate consortium. And they're doing a grassroots that what do they call it? an AstroTurf campaign, like a fake grassroots campaign. Mm. The group is something like, you know, Citizens for Housing Justice. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of uh, because the um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is now uh, relaxing child labor laws and i just keep yeah. thinking of that scene in zoolander where Magotu says i'm a little baby and i want to work these politicians <laughs> won't let me work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just every time i see this i think zoolander did that because it was absurd and hilarious and now we've actually got mainstream politicians pushing this as the future of like well, let's I, get the I children live- back to work I live in Texas, which is one of the, you know, one of the states in the U.S. that is what is called a right to work state. Mm. And right to work is another wonderful phrase because right to work basically means right to fire. That's what that means. It's a right to fire state. It's it's a state with fewer worker protections, not more. So it's not that nobody really cares about somebody's right to work in the state of Texas. What they care about is the employer's right to fire. Exactly. Yes. And, and hire and hire whoever they want and not have to observe, you know, very many regulations. Um, so, you know, but it's an it's incredible how language can be even sometimes if it's like blindingly obvious language and its attempts to manipulate you, people still kind of fall for it on some level. Like a lot of the uh, 
a lot of the restrictions, you know, the the this, the enabling of surveillance after after nine eleven and 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 the uh, removal of a lot of basic privacy protections. The surveillance state, as we know it, was really created by this piece of legislation, which was named the USA Patriot Act. Brilliant, brilliant name, brilliant, brilliance in naming. Because now you because you can't even object to it without being without people saying you're really against the USA Patriot Act. Really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they could have had like they should have. I mean, they could like go further and have like, you know, the, you know, turn baby, you know, to get the babies, babies are acceptable uh, uh, potted meat uh, material now. And, and it could be the, you know, the Baby Protection Act of 2023, you know. <laughs> George Orwell is called. He wants his ideas all back. <laughs> he wants them all back. Well, but that's another thing is, you know, the 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 reactionaries have claimed Orwell now, too, which I find doubly ironic. It's like it's like you read something like the National Review and people are constantly saying, well, it's very Orwellian. And it's like, no, you know what is very Orwellian? You guys. <laughs> Absolutely. And your freedom fries. And your freedom fries. Oh, my God. Freedom fries. That was like. I was so embarrassed to be an American when they did that. We're not calling them French fries anymore. They're, we're calling them freedom fries. Uh, and, and what an insult. What an insult to the French. I tell you, the French have been the best friend, really honest, truly the best friend the United States has had globally because they're not always on our side. When we're full of shit, if they think we're full of shit, they tell us. That's a real friend. That's what, yeah, exactly. That's what you, you where, are, where are you going with that shirt? That's the sort of right, person exactly, you want. Exactly. Yes, yes. France is the ally that says you're not really wearing that, are you? <laughs> One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you as well, Matt, was you're doing, you're looking at, you, you, you've got your enterprise of your your bookshop as well. Tell me about about the bookshop where you're actually, um, you know, hosting some of my uh, some of my best uh, guests work yeah i was looking at your list of guests and it's like there's like there's like 12 people whose books we've you know not only carried but aggressively promoted because they're great books you should make a, a john bleasdale writers on film corner you know what i wouldn't rule it out actually um but uh, mzs.press is the address and it's a it's an online bookstore it's run by myself and my partner judith carter and it's uh it's an arts bookstore we you know we call it the uh, the arts bookstore of the internet and uh it's just books about the arts. It's film and television and music and visual art. We have a kids section. We have a, a section on disability. We have a section on the self um, and a lot of other sections. And we're constantly expanding it. And it's new books. It's recent books, but it's also older titles. And and I, I used to work when I was in college, I had multiple jobs. And one of them was I worked at the college bookstore. Mm. And another one was I worked at the Southwest Film Archives. This was at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And so I do have the mentality of, you know, the the nice way to say it would be an archivist and the, the not nice way would be to say pack rat. Um, and and I, I have hundreds and hundreds of books myself that I've been traveling around with for decades. My children growing up basically felt like they were living in a bookstore because I had so many books. And um and the bookstore is kind of an extension of that. And and I'm I'm the sort of person who will tell people about a book and then often I would loan them my copy and sometimes I got it back and sometimes I didn't. But I always wanted to make sure that we have not just we have some big ticket items like so we have some rare signed books that are, you know, hundreds of dollars and stuff. But most of the books, probably I would say 85 to 90 percent of it is used books. And, and mm. that, that we do that very intentionally because i want somebody who is in high school or college who's curious who wants to get a book about some subject that interests them to not have to feel like uh, they got robbed you know so we have stuff that's like it's a few dollars we have a whole section of under under 20 dollars books and uh yeah but i love it i love it and it's it's complicated retail is complicated and dealing with customers is complicated and and the post and you know i i i know people at the post office better than i know most of my friends at this point a regular customer yeah 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 so regular that like when we have a big weekend and we've got like 30 or 40 or 50 books and we're pulling them in on a dolly that have to be mailed out like i always joke that i expect them to you know they see us coming through the window and they put the grates down and and say nobody's <laughs> here no one's here today 
<laughs> I thought you were going to say they have they open another window, especially for you. They have they have a window. Uh, yeah, built. see, that's where that's where they should go. That's where they should be going with this eventually. Uh, um, but yeah, it's it's but it's also it's kind of great when you're in line at the post office with a bunch of books that you're sending out to people all over the U.S. and the world, and and someone will start a conversation with you, and you'll tell them about. Uh, about the bookstore and then give them the address. And then like later that afternoon, they've ordered a book and it's uh, and often it's a very, it's a book you forgot you was even in inventory, which is really cool. You know, there, there mm. have been times we have so many books now that it's like, there are times where somebody orders a book and Judith and I will look at each other and go, we have that, <laughs> you know, and then we go, we, we go find it and it's like, yeah, we do. You know, it's like, we have one copy, but here it is, you know, ne next to the Ark of the Covenant and uh, the sled with Rosebud written on it. That's exactly it. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's, it's it, it kind of getting people to, I, I want to try to get people out of their comfort zone and I'm not, mm. I'm trying to split the difference between like, I don't want to go too far. I don't want to be one of those. Like I try not to come at it from the position of, I can't believe you haven't seen this already, or I can't believe you don't know about this book because that to me seems very aggressive and off-putting and kind of crappy to do to people. Like I, I don't like that response on social hmm. media. Where it's like, I just watched Bonnie and Clyde for the first time. And there's somebody in the response about going, what took you so long? Yeah, yeah. It's like, why do you want to turn a good thing into a bad thing? Why yeah. would you say something like that? Like, a better answer is, and what did you think of it? Yeah, yeah. You know, or even, I wish I could watch that for the first time. Exactly. How does it, how does it play now? Because when I watched it, it was the 1980s, so I had it played different to how I'm sure it plays today. Yeah, yeah I would think so. I would think so. And uh, you know, and the, and also the thing is, like, we as as buffs of one time, uh, one type or another, we tend to get locked into our little pea brains and we think that the world of art that we inhabit is the world that everyone else inhabits and there are people out there who don't know who they don't know who spielberg is oh absolutely absolutely you know, they don't know who they don't know who george lucas i mean some of the most popular directors of all time they're people who don't know who alfred hitchcock is they don't know who john ford is and and why would they they're working 60 hours a week yeah. You know, they're working 60 hours a week and arts education in this country has been pretty much destroyed during my lifetime. And and that's another that's another reason for having this bookstore is to kind of try to kind of try to reintroduce people to uh, kind of a common language of culture and 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 uh, and think about it like instead of an algorithm, an algorithm, we have I, I always say like we should we should have like a what you call a book concierge or something. Because that's what bookstores used to be, bookstores and movie theaters and video stores, too, where, you know, I used to love going to the video store and I would rent a particular movie. And the person behind the desk uh, was often a movie buff. Why wouldn't you know what kind of person would work at a video store if they didn't love movies? You know, they were all movie buffs of one kind or another. And they would say, oh, if you like this, have you seen this Japanese film that has the same plot? And I'd say no. And they're like, well, we have it over there and I'll go rent it. And now I'm a fan of that director. So absolutely, so many consequential sort of decisions of, uh, I've made and turns I've made because of a librarian or or, or someone in a bookshop. I remember someone just suggesting I read uh, what was the book? I was because I was always a huge science fiction fan, and they went, "Oh, you like this," and gave me one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> and, and and I thought this isn't science fiction. Why would I? Why would I possibly like this? And I read it and just thought, oh my god, what am I doing reading science fiction? I should be reading these this kind of thing. And it was just you know, it's just a, an old lady in a bookshop say just saying, time time for you to move on to something like this. And it was perfect. And, and there's also the joy of just stumbling upon something by yourself. Mm. And and what I used to do, and I still do it, is in bookstores. I will. I will be in a section, I'll spend some time in a section and I'll just randomly pull books and look at them and read, read the back summary and just, and, and if the summary seems interesting, I'll open it up to the first page and start reading. And if, and if I'm still reading after 10 pages, I buy the book. Mm -hmm. I still do that. And, and, uh, you know, I think my first experience that I remember where that happened was there was a book uh, by Theodore Wiesner called the car thief. And I think it came out in like 1970 or 71 and it's literally just about a car thief. He's a he's a teenage car thief, and it's a guy who is you know in a kind of a bad home life situation, and he's and you know kind of what you would call an at risk youth, and mm. uh, 
And it's a very realistic story. There's nothing, there's no genre film elements. It's not like he gets involved in robbing an armored car or anything. He's just, he's just a sad ass, a 19 year old kid, you know? Um, and I never heard of this author. I'd never heard of this book. And it's one of my favorite novels. And, and if I hadn't just randomly pulled it off the shelf, I wouldn't know about it. The, the, there has to be a well going back to our discussion about 2001 a space odyssey serendipity has to has to have you have to have space in your life for that as well yeah absolutely well and that's the uh that's 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 what all the great not just the great film directors but i think all of the great artists who work in collaboration uh do which is you create you you create a controlled environment in which accidents can happen and 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 inspirations can happen and you know how many of the great moments in movies are did not come from the script or from the director they came from a suggestion by somebody and one of the directors who i think is more open to that than almost anyone is david lynch i love the fact that that the guy the actor who played bob on twin peaks was not even an actor and he and he saw him like behind a piece of furniture and was like that guy's face is really unnerving and like and he ends up casting him he ends up he ends up creating a character and casting him, and and that's a sign of a healthy that's a truly healthy ego to be able to do something like that where you're not threatened by someone else's idea you know just because it's not your idea there are a lot of directors who would never do something like that and there are a lot of directors who don't even want the anybody below the line to talk to them you know they're very very uh, against uh, anybody else having a say and. And yeah, I'm sure it could get annoying if everybody thinks they're the director. That 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 could impede the production of the movie. But, <laughs> but there's this whole middle ground. There's this whole middle ground of of you know. I I love the story of on Scarface, the final shootout in Scarface. Uh, one of the low angle shots of the of the goons racing to kill Tony Montana. That that came about because Spielberg visited the set that day, and he's like, "You should put a camera on the floor here. You might get a really interesting angle." And De Palma was like, "Thanks, Steven Spielberg," and he did it. It wasn't like, get off my set. Stop telling me how to direct, you know? <laughs> Although I'm sure it helps if it's Spielberg. It helps if it's Spielberg. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, your, your, your Uncle Earl, you know? Um, <laughs> you know. I love the I love those stories of directors helping other directors out. There's a good one on um, The Spy Who Loved Me. The guy who was directing that, I think it was Lewis Gilbert might, might be his name. Anyway, he was an old English director and his eyesight was failing him. And he um, and and the huge set that had been built for the submarine battle at the end, he couldn't light it because he basically couldn't see the depth that was required for it to be for him to light it. And mm. Kubrick was on uh, um, shooting The Shining next door, and um, one of the uh, the director called him up and said, "You've got to help me with this." And he said, "Okay." Um, have a long lunch, close down the, your set, and I don't want anyone on the set to know about it being me. And he went in and he lit it for him. And oh, just, my God. Just think Stanley Kubrick worked as a gaffer <laughs> on, a, I love that. on the movie. Yeah. I love that. I love that story, actually. And as you probably know, because you're writing a book about Terrence Malick, if you study the credits of Terrence Malick's movies, you see the names of a lot of people who would later become important in the film industry or were already important and they're in their working crew yeah. just to say they worked on a Terrence Malick movie. Like, you know, I can't remember an example right now, but I know there was, there were several in the credits of the new world where I was like, wait a second, that person's made three movies and it's like, you know, assistant cameraman. Andrew, Andrew Dominic, <laughs> Andrew Dominic yeah. works, shoots second unit on, um, on the new world. And he'd already made chopper. He was already sort of, a. A, rel a, a director you know um yeah yeah, I d yeah. I don't, he hadn't made i don't think he'd made jesse james yet but uh but yeah he was uh he was yeah. I, i've been reading your reviews of the um in fact you're gonna you're gonna feature quite heavily in the later chapters of the book <laughs> oh as as the critical as the critical um reception of his works come becomes increasingly shall we say divided because I, you know, I have to hold my hand up and say when I watch those films, uh, to the wonder, to the wonder, I was still very much on board, and then Night yeah. of Cups and and Song to Song, I was I was finding him difficult, and I and there was an overwhelming critical narrative of mm -hmm. this guy has lost the plot. I think David Thompson wrote something about him in the biographical uh, dictionary of cinema, which was very you know. 
Yeah. No, n- never in the history of mankind has one fallen from such a height. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm I'm paraphrasing, but I've been yeah, looking, but not, but not by much. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been looking at you and obviously rewatching the films and and trying to get get through to them and uh, and appreciating them much much more guided by your yourself and and several others you know richard brody i think is a, a big champion of those later films as well yeah yeah i think so and i also think about you know there's a line and i'm paraphrasing uh, but i think about it all the time in, in relation to malik which is it was several years ago i think it was when night of cups or song to song came out or something and and uh, nick pinkerton uh, the film comment uh, writer said uh basically he he really didn't like how there was every time Malik had a new movie out, there were like people would go on social media and act like they'd been personally attacked by Terrence Malick. And they, and they talked about it like they were Marvel films. Like I'm so sick of this kind of movie. And it's like, he's one guy. There's like nobody else who makes movies like this. And he doesn't, and it's not like he's making one a month. And if you don't like it, just don't watch it. Just don't watch it. Like it's not that hard. And, and I, I love Malick's films for a lot of reasons, and one of them is that he he has this kind of transcendentalist uh, moonchild sort of sensibility, where he's you know he's always as a friend. My friend Dave puts it: Malick is always open to the possibility of rapture, and some of the best scenes in his movies are about people experiencing extraordinary moments of catharsis, or appreciation of beauty, or feeling like they have a place in the universe. And it's often not a big, obviously dramatic moment. It's something very quiet, and you know people looking at looking at the ocean, looking at the, looking at the sun, looking at plants, looking at animals and things. And, you know, Malik is among his other uh, reasons to love Malik is uh, how many major directors even notice nature anymore. I mean, really notice nature. I don't mean you park the camera. There's some mountains and you park the camera and get a shot of the mountains. I don't mean that. I'm talking about like the way Malik will cut to an insect on a blade of grass or 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 a butterfly or a deer in the meadow or something. And sometimes he'll give you like a sequence of shots that show flora and fauna before he'll get into the human action. And it's a way of sort of humbling us a little bit, you know, and, and that line in the new world, of why does nature war with itself? Like when I first saw that, I thought, boy, he really he's finally disappeared into his own navel with that one. And then I thought about it some more and I thought, no, no, he's right. He's right. Like humans are a part of nature, and when they war with each other, it's nature warring with itself. It's actually not that complicated of a concept, but it's not something that n- movies normally think to say. This is the weird thing: is that that the the Terence Malick negative review has become like a genre in its in and of itself. It's like every yeah. time a new film comes out, it's like, oh, okay, how how can I compare this to a perfume ad? Let's let me count the ways, and it and. Criticism sort of stops doing its job at that point. So a lot of the criticisms that you get, for instance, you know, there's no story. Actually, that the if if there is a problem with his last three or four movies, it's been that there's been too much story. I mean, it's it's a, <laughs> it's a very obliquely told story, but you can't watch yeah. song to song and say there's no story in there. There are there are three different love stories going on in totally different directions. You know, it's it if anything, yeah. it's chocker. Yes, yes, that's true, and I think I think A Hidden Life is one of his best films. Mm, mm. I think, and that one, that's the one that I think, in some ways, is the summation of everything he's about. Because you get the you get the uh, pre the pre aughts Terrence Malick, like the pre Tree of Life Terrence Malick, or or where would you say that his? It's hard to say exactly where this sort of modern Malick style began, but I feel like it was probably to the wonder. I think you could see inklings of it in the tree of life, but, but in any case, uh, there are self-contained scenes with beginnings, middles and ends in the hidden life. And then there's also that kind of montage driven style of filmmaking that he does where it's very literally free associative, like one image inspiring the placement of another image. And, and it creates a feeling rather than an argument a lot of mm. the time. And, mm. uh, and yeah, Hidden Life is great, and it's also just a great. The, is, he's so good to his actors. He see he he you really have to. I would imagine you really got to trust him and vibe with him to 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 do your best work with Malik. But somebody who understands Malik, like like they kind of get what he needs, does really well. Like I thought Ryan Gosling and Michael Fassbender did very well for him. Yeah, I agree. I think they understood like you know that where they kind of at one point like Michael Fassbender like starts imitating an ape. Yes. You know, and <laughs> and, it, and I thought that was so beautiful. Beautiful because that's actually I could see Malik uh, standing off to the side, smiling, going, "Yeah, man, 
this is this is this is what I wanted. Yeah, this is the good stuff. <laughs> this is the good stuff right here. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, uh, Ben Affleck gave an interview years ago after he'd done To the Wonder, where he was. I I couldn't tell if he was describing or complaining. Sometimes it's hard to tell from these articles, but. He said something to the effect of like, well, the thing about shooting with Terry is you'll be having a conversation with your co-star and you think the camera's on you, but it turns out it 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 it, it swung to the left to follow a squirrel as it climbed up a tree. And uh, I read that and I thought, yeah, uh, OK, well, if you if you're making a list of reasons why Terrence Malick is awesome, then, yeah, that's that's uh, that's a thing that would happen. Like, who else would do that? I I, I mean, it is like the dog in the, uh, that Pixar movie is like squirrel. You know, like there is a little bit of that. Well, let me just ask you one one last question, Matt. Uh, what give us a book recommendation? I know that's an impossible one for you, but I, uh, yeah, we we like having some book recommendations. So, uh, a film book, if if you please. Well, Isaac Butler's The Method, I think, is terrific, and it just won the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction. And it's kind of a history of method. It, it's a, the history and development of the modern style of acting. And and a lot of it's about Stanislavski, but it kind of continues on beyond that. And that's that's a really uh, not just an impeccably researched book, but it's really it's one of those books where you feel like you're watching a movie. You feel like you're watching mm. like Amadeus or something like you the characters really come alive. It's just a wonderful piece of writing. Uh, and uh, Dana Stevens, cameraman, is is terrific about Buster Keaton. And it's not a biography, strictly speaking. Um, but it's uh, it does sort of give you uh, a sense of place in, in history and aesthetically uh, what he was all about. And then uh, of older books, I think Michael Benson's 2001 book is a great one I would recommend because people uh, so many people have seen that movie. Uh, and and so, you know, you're not asking people to read a book about a movie they haven't seen. And and the anecdotes and lessons that are included in that book are uh, can apply to almost any movie that you can think of. Um, including things that have nothing to do with science fiction. It's really, it's a great insight into the filmmaking process and it's in paperback and you can pick it up used. So Excellent. Those, are, those are three, those are three to start with. Superb. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And it was an honor to be on this, uh, this momentous podcast. Thank you for asking me.